Hello, I'm Kevin Jones, an OHS consultant and writer of the Safety at Work blog. We're going to dive right into a global piece of the OHS puzzle with our next guest as part of this Talking Safety series, which is brought to you from the 23rd World Congress on Safety and Health at Work. As the global lead of the Occupational Safety and Health team at the International Labour Organization, Along with her team, she's also leading the standard setting process and development of technical guidelines for biological hazards, human factors and ergonomics, and machine guarding. I'd really like to welcome Dr. Manal Azi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, happy to be here. So Manal, uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself and uh, how and when OHS captured your attention? So where do I begin? I obviously didn't think I'd be wearing hard hats and talking <laughs> about safety and health all my life, but I was very interested in health uh, growing up in general. So I started off with environmental health and public health more specifically, and one thing led to another. Um, and I discovered the International Labour Organization and did uh, some work on the prevention of major industrial accidents as part of my thesis at the time. After that, I continued in parallel um, some studies in my PhD in occupational health policy um, between um, England, the UK, and Sydney here in Australia. Actually, I went to Sydney University. Um, and yeah, so I started focusing on occupational safety and health, and I discovered it's such a rich area, covering so many different sectors, so many workers, and affecting the lives of so many people, because what happens in your workplace really affects families of workers and affects people globally, but also affects businesses and productivity. So now you're the global lead of ILO's occupational safety and health team. What message would you give to people wanting to gain a better understanding of both the ILO and the work that your team does in occupational safety and health? I think the ILO is one of these UN agencies that are very specialised. And what makes us very different is that we don't only listen to what governments want, and they're not the only ones that govern sort of our, our governing body, but mostly workers and their representatives, unions globally, and employers and their representatives have an equal voice in the ILO um, structure, management agenda, and, and how we prioritize work. But obviously the ILO covers all labor issues and everything to do with every worker in the world um, from gender equality to the elimination of child labor, forced labor, freedom of association issues. But health is a little um, orphan in the ILO, I would say. When we talk of health, people probably think of the World Health Organization. But when it comes to occupational health and exposures in workplaces, the ILO has the biggest and largest mandate. In 2022, the International Labour Conference declared a safe and healthy working environment as a fundamental principle and right at work. So can you tell us uh, about what this means for workers and employers? That was indeed a huge achievement that we've been waiting for for decades. And for some, it was like, how has this not happened before? Uh, lives at work are important, fundamental, and they should be a right and should have been. But it's really, you know, the way that was, that process was made is there's a declaration that recognized four other rights and principles, like the elimination of forced labor and child labor and the right to non-discrimination and the freedom association. So there were four core labor issues where safety and health didn't feature. And then after four years of discussions in our governing body among these tripartite uh, groups, um, we came to an agreement that, of course, a safe safe and healthy working environment needs to be a right and principle. And that has huge implications. It means two of our main standards and conventions on OSH that normally need to be ratified by countries to then be translated into national law and implementation, no longer need to be ratified to be in, in force. Mm -hmm. So countries today have an obligation to abide by the requirements of these two basic fundamental conventions in light of this decision. And this has huge implications because countries need to now invest resources, change their legislation to abide by these minimum standards. I think this, uh, this Congress is a significant platform in informing people about that. We, we have been aware of it since it was announced, but it's, we don't yet understand it. And I'm sure that your time here at the Congress will help us do that. That'll be terrific. 
Sure, I think this Congress is a huge opportunity with the thousands of um, people here, practitioners, experts, academics, uh, decision makers um, gathering. I think, I hope that the ILO will have opportunities throughout its very symposia, technical sessions and reporting sessions to share some of these highlights of uh, ILO and our constituents, really. The ILO is 187 member states and their accomplishments. And so having being convened here and it's a great honor to be in Sydney and to have all this work being background work leading up to this um, great Congress has been wonderful to provide this platform and hopefully we can make the best use of it and to learn a little bit more in detail about what we can provide and how we can help. You're speaking also at the um, Is Health Taking the Lead in Occupational Health and Safety? A technical talk. Can you tell us a bit about the shift to address physical um, and mental health in the workplace? As I said at the beginning, we, safety and health was seen as hard hats. I'm doing my best that we don't see it as such anymore. And we do see that among the major number of fatalities and also chronic diseases, like it's really diseases that's really taking the bigger toll on injuries and diseases that are occupational or attributable to, to different occupations. So we need to shift the focus onto health and the prevention and creating that culture of prevention when when we're talking about exposures, um, be they chemical, everything to do from silica, asbestos, that continue to be uh, issues that the workers are facing today. Their impacts are really after we retire. So we need to follow this whole life cycle and human-centered approach to managing health and preventing health. So this shift in paradigm um, to health, including the high focus on mental health, even after COVID-19 and, and the changes we are facing in job security, um, in everything to do with working from home, the interplay with domestic violence and broader violence and harassment issues at work, managing psychosocial risk and psychosocial health in different jobs, be they in offices, in manufacturing or out in the field, the rate of suicide and that work-life balance that people are trying to achieve um, are all important uh, factors and indicators of uh, quality of working life. So we're no longer just preventing an accident, but we're hoping to improve the quality of our working lives that can be in line with our aspirations and our identities and our accomplishments and achievements and give us a balance between what is a personal life and, and development, but also a work identity that we would like to have. So um, we're at the Congress. What do you want to learn from the Congress? A lot. I think there must be a richness that we probably haven't seen anywhere. It's in this 21st century, 2023, where in this huge country that already in and within itself has so much to offer and so much experience in this area. Um, I think with every booth I'm going to stop at, with every symposium and every session, um, there is still so much to learn. Some of the people here have focused their whole lives on one sub area. Mm. Um, and that's a luxury I find that we don't have at the ILO where we need to be everywhere discussing everything, sometimes only touching the surface. So here is like for me to find different uh, networks of people, uh, different interests of people and try to bring that together in my future roles and, and different circumstances where, oh, I've met somebody who's from this country doing exactly that thing. This is going to be beneficial for you in Costa Rica, in Peru or wherever we're going to be. And I think it's the that cross um, uh, finding these synergies between the, the various countries and initiatives so that we're not all, not all reinventing the wheel, but building on, on the knowledge that's already out there. Well, I feel very privileged having uh, spent some time with you interviewing you because the rest of the Congress, I think, will see each other across the crowd and that will be it. Who knows? Uh, we'll both be very busy. But look, thank you very much for your time today. It's been wonderful. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, happy to have joined you in this interview. Thanks so much. For those watching, if you want to join the chat about OHS technology and many other hot topics being discussed at the 23rd World Congress on Health and Safety at Work, head to the World Congress uh, event platform where you can access film sessions, symposia, and a lot of exclusive online content. Thanks very much for watching and have a great Congress.